Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo. Coffee with Karen. So this is Thursday's edition and welcome. Today's topic, I'm going to be discussing inflammation. <clears throat> and I decided, well, you know, this is pretty much um, everything that I've done for the last, I don't know, nearly 30 years, uh, and really what I focus on right now. So my background is uh, I started out in the fitness industry. Um, I became a sports therapist uh, back in 1995. So obviously dealing with inflammation from injuries. Okay, and then more recently, uh, when I left the fitness industry, I went back to train uh, back into nutrition, but primarily focusing on the low carb, high fat lifestyle. Okay, and I studied under Professor Tim Noakes, who, as a doctor and a scientist and himself an athlete, um, he'd run 70 marathons and ultra marathons and written an array of books on the subject found himself with type 2 diabetes and uh, obviously as an athlete uh, that was that was a bit of a shock and what he found it was down to the carb loading which so many athletes and athletes do so obviously he then went on this mission for the low carb high fat lifestyle and all the huge benefits it entails for me personally I initially got into it from a completely selfish um, way in, as in after leaving the fitness industry, I had gained a lot of weight. And so I wasn't thinking about inflammation or or the health aspects. I just wanted to lose weight fast. And I did that through the keto diet and combining that with intermittent fasting. But then because it worked so fast, I then really wanted to understand why because it went against everything that I'd studied previously being a level three personal trainer we were we were taught that you know carbohydrates we need that for energy um you know and breakfast is the most important meal of the day uh, which is why then I went and did this the ketogenic diet for therapeutic purposes via the nutrition network and although it was basically designed for doctors and nurses who are dealing with type 2 diabetes or ADHD or epilepsy. Um, I pretty much begged them. I said the reason why I wanted to do it and I wanted to have the scientific data because this was still quite a fairly new concept. And I'm and I'm really glad because what I have found is that health has definitely improved. Um, inflammation has definitely reduced through following this regime. So let's talk about what is, you know, I mean, inflammation is something that is needed initially because it's the first port of call, as it were, to trigger the healing response. So we need a little bit of inflammation, but we do not need prolonged inflammation. And what we're finding now is that chronic inflammation leads to all kinds of, of diseases. Now, we know that, you know, years ago, our ancestors may may have died for other reasons, but they weren't dying from the illnesses that we are dying from these days. You know, heart disease, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes. Now, in the UK, the NHS is spending 10 billion a year on diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Now, that I would say, is a pandemic. And by the time somebody knows they've got type 2 diabetes, they're a long way down. They could have been diagnosed way before. So in my opinion, there are millions, millions of people walking around that um, with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance, that if, it, if, if something is not done about it now, they're heading that way, Right. So inflammation is, is, is really the key, I feel. And, uh, and there are different types of, so, so what, what is it? I mean, inflammation, say you 
um, pull a hamstring or, or pull a calf muscle. Okay, that's 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 my whole background. So what happens? You know, there's there's heat in that area. There's definitely pain if you've ever pulled your calf muscle or, or a hamstring. There will be redness if, if you were looking at it. And in general, there would be swelling. And in some cases, you know, you're not really going to be able to move it more. Now, why would this be? Well, obviously, if you damage, say, your calf muscle, so you've, you've torn some of the muscle muscle tissue, right? Well, your muscle fibers are surrounded by zillions of blood vessels. So quite often you're going to have torn some of the blood vessels, hence the bleeding, hence the bruising. OK, so the swelling is there for a few reasons, really. Um, you know, for one, it's like the reason you get pain is to say, oi, stop doing what you're doing to prevent doing any further damage. And obviously, it's going to initiate the healing response because then the body needs to know, well, you know, what have I done? What do I need to send? You know, stem cells, what do they need to be? Do they need to be muscle fiber? Do they need to be um, blood vessel sort of cells? You know, wh whatever it is, have you damaged the tendon? Have you damaged the ligament? What do we need to repair? Now, when we treat uh, an injury in the beginning stages, you know, as a sports therapist, I'm there to, to, to treat injuries. Now, for the first 24 to 48 hours, we would recommend ice. Now, why would that be? It's to actually reduce inflammation. So obviously, inflammation is there to start the process, but we don't want it to stay there. So in a way, we would put ice on the injury for one reason to actually keep the blood flow away from that area, just like if you had a, a leaky pipe, the plumber would turn off the water supply first, right? You know, you don't want blood flow going because you need to first repair the, the tissue uh, and the blood vessel tissue, um, ideally with without so much blood flow. So you put ice on the area to keep everything away. That's sort of part of the reason, okay? Now, a lot of people would think maybe you've got to keep ice on it for, for a really long time. That can cause a problem. Now, I would always say to my clients, maybe 10 to 15 minutes to keep safe, maybe up to 20 minutes ice, because any longer, you actually get the opposite effect and you actually really attract the blood flow to that area. So imagine if the plumber hadn't fixed the pipe, there's going to be a mess, right, if you put the water supply back on too soon. And that's really what's happening um, in your muscles, okay? So if you apply heat and there's been damage, you're going to create a bit of a mess. For the Obviously, the body will tidy it up, but why create that mess? We, we want to have a neat uh, healing process, okay? So, you know, if that's what's going on from, you know, when you get inflammation from an, say, an external force, whether you've had a fall or whether you've overused the muscle, that's inflammation from that kind of thing. But there's all sorts of other things, right? There's all sorts of other things that cause inflammation. Number one, it can be stress. Now, funnily, with pretty much all the topics that we've discussed over the previous weeks, uh, stress really has come up with pretty much everything. You know, cortisol is a stress hormone. And it's there for a good reason, because, you know, our ancestors years ago, we would, you know, we, we want that fight, flight or freeze scenario, maybe not so much the freeze, but the fight or flight. <laughs> you know, when we were being chased by saber tooth cut tigers. And the thing with stress is, yeah, it's there to save the day for that important thing um, because everything else pretty much gets shut down, right? Because your, your goal is survival. The problem is these days we haven't actually got a saber-toothed tiger chasing us. You know, there is actually no danger. However, there's a lot of perceived danger which is the key. And so quite often the body is under so much stress all the time. Cortisol is present. Now, even with relating to my own program, which on the face of it is, is focusing on weight loss, when cortisol is present, it's a bit like when insulin's present, 
you cannot use, you're not going to be using up your, your fat stores, right? Because if cortisol is present, it doesn't care about you, but you know, it, it's there for the moment. It's there for that moment to save you. But if we're under too much stress for too long, this is this is not a good position for the body to be in prolonged stress. Right. That's going to cause inflammation. You know, as I said, inflammation is a good thing. But the goal of the inflammation is to respond to what the stimuli is to, to, to create balance. So whether it was an outside force, whether it was, you know, it comes from stress, whether it comes from chemicals, whether it comes from viruses, bacteria, there's all sorts of things that are causing it, right? Um, could be an allergy, could be a virus, bacterial infection, um, like I said, stress, certain chemicals, um, Artificial light, not enough sleep, not enough vitamin D, sunlight can be the cause of inflammation. So what can we do about it? Because we do not want cellular inflammation for too long because, as I said, that's going to go on to cause a problem, heart disease, stroke, cancers, type 2 diabetes. So what is the cause then? The biggest cause is going to come from the way we eat. Now, I mean, I know myself when I was, uh, when I put on all the weight, I could tell that I was swollen, you know, I could tell there was inflammation. And it, it, it is what we eat that is, that is, that is causing this. So if you look back, if you look back at photos of people, say, back in the 60s, very few people were overweight or obese, okay? The average BMI, so your body mass index of a woman was actually lower than a man. Uh, these days it's higher. It tends to be the average. And so what's changed? Well, our diet has changed dramatically since the 60s. Before the introduction of high fructose corn syrup, you know, because I'm going to say sugar is the enemy. Sugar is a huge cause for inflammation, carbohydrates, right? Any, any form of carbohydrates. So back in the 60s, we had a diet that consisted mainly of meat, fish, you know, they would have been high fat. They cook with lard, right? Um, tubers, uh, fruit, but seasonal fruit, locally grown fruit, right? Not the, what I would call manufactured fruit that you possibly see today in certain supermarkets, you know? This is not, they, they played around with it, right? So whereas these days they advised us to eat the whole grains, you know, have the majority of our diet, 55% coming from carbohydrates, which I would go as far to say is, is mm, the root cause of, of a lot of issues. You know, if you look around you, it, it, we're just surrounded by manufactured processed foods and it's carbohydrate. So, Another problem is, again, we were told to use polyunsaturated oils, vegetable oils. Again, uh, the worst thing we could be doing and another cause for inflammation. So <clears throat> let's go into this. Um, as I teach, you know, with regards to if you're just looking for weight loss, okay, in reduction in inflammation is going to be a byproduct of the program anyway. But I'm not leading with, you know, um, people don't realize that they need to reduce inflammation. But we follow a low carb and go back to a high fat diet as we used to eat, not just in the 60s, the whole of the duration of uh, humans being alive. I mean, I would be, I would go as far to say, you know, it, you talk to different people, there's different uh, research out there, how long we've been around, right? I mean, some say as long as 3 million years. Now, I would 
pretty much guarantee that three million years ago, if we were eating the foods that we eat now, we wouldn't be here. The human race would not have survived this long. We survived because of the foods we used to eat. Things have changed very, very recently, which is why people are living very unhealthy lives. It's, it, the, this has a knock-on effect to their mental health as well. Everything, the health of their cells, the medication they need to be on to try and combat that, it, it has a whole knock-on effect. So, yeah, I would go as far to say as the human species would not have survived this long if we were eating the kinds of foods that we eat today back then. So th we want to go back to how we used to eat, okay? So let, let, let's break it down. You see, you, you know, think about it. You know, sugar, we didn't have, we didn't consume so much sugar as we do now. And I'm not talking just about the sweet things. I'm just talking about chocolate and cakes and sweets. I'm talking about bread that breaks down into sugar, pasta, rice, potatoes. It all breaks down to sugar and it all uh, triggers an insulin response. And that is also going to trigger an inflammation response. So the body, the, the blood itself can only cope with one teaspoon, so about three grams, three to four grams of sugar in the system. So each meal, if you have more than one teaspoon of sugar, your body will store the excess as fat. That is fact. That is a fact. Because after a teaspoon of sugar has been consumed by the body, Insulin is released by the pancreas. Now, insulin is what I call the fat controller, and it's it's in charge of energy distribution. So where is that energy going? Are you going to use it or are you going to store it? And so carbohydrate, if it's broken down to glucose or fructose, insulin is going to store the excess as, as fat. And the problem is these days we are so addicted to sugar we are eating it consistently throughout the day. We, we, we don't go a couple of hours without eating because we're hungry, because we're addicted, because, it, you know, the amount of sugar that is stored in the muscles as energy or, or in the liver is very minimal and the excess is stored as fat. So what that means is when your body has used up what was stored in your muscles or your liver, which isn't a lot, it's going to tell you that it's hungry again. And this is why we have this constant battle with hunger. The reason people are struggling to, to lose weight is because they're battling. Nobody's going to win against hunger. It doesn't matter how determined you are, no matter how much willpower you have. So the problem is the consumption of too many carbohydrates. Now, to give you an example, one slice of bread is the equivalent of five teaspoons of sugar. That's one slice of bread. Now, an average bowl of pasta or a bowl of rice could be the equivalent of, say, 16 to 20 teaspoons of sugar. So the thing is, because you, can, you can't store all that energy in your muscles, because the amount that you can store at any one time, your muscles is very, very minimal. So the excess is stored. What is the point of that? Because we're actually never using up that stored energy because your body's hungry again for the carbs and it wants that quick fix. Every single time. So let's take a look at, so that's that's carbohydrates. We, 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 we don't want the starchy processed carbohydrates it will cause inflammation. Now, fructose. Fructose is broken down in your liver. That's actually even worse. So this is the real cause, uh, you know, when we're talking about inflammation and causing illnesses, fructose is, 
is the problem. We used to think fat was the energy, fat, sorry, fat was the enemy. And it isn't. You see, we were told, you know, cholesterol is bad for the heart. We now know that is not true. You want to have high HDL. So when nowadays when you get your cholesterol tested, you, you will get the balance. So your HDL you want high, your LDL you want low. However, there are two types of LDL. So the LDL you get from fat is actually quite buoyant and doesn't really do any damage. Okay. But the LDL that you get that's denser is actually coming from too much fructose. Because just like glucose going into the muscles, or so glycogen stored in the muscles as energy, you can, you've only got a small storage space. Uh, fructose, so what I'm talking about is fruit, fruit juices. This is why fruit juice, you know, glass of orange juice is not as healthy as we once thought it was. Sugar, even honey. I mean, I'm not saying honey is bad, you know, all the time. It depends how much you've already got in your liver. Obviously, high fructose corn syrup, which is cheaper than sugar and is used in so many manufactured and processed foods. Um, these too much goes into the liver. The liver can only cope with so much. So the excess is stored as fat around the middle uh, uh, through a process called gluconeogenesis. And the fat that it lays around the middle is different to the normal fat on the rest of your body. OK. It's denser. It's the dense LDL that causes the problem. And that causes the inflammation. Now, interestingly enough, um, the clear up operation, OK, um, would actually come from vitamin D, which I suppose in the uh, natural world during the summer months, you would tend to eat locally grown um, fruit berries and things and then of course you've got the sunlight you're getting the vitamin d which is going to clear up any problems the issue nowadays is that most people are vitamin d deficient now i know this personally because uh, i mean for eight years i lived in the algarve so i had plenty of sun coming back into the uk in 2011 working in gyms so teaching fitness all over the place in air conditioned no daylight um, I actually, the reason I gave up teaching fitness, I was feeling my age. <laughs> I was 46 when I gave up. So I was, um, you know, putting it down to that really thinking, oh, it's time to give up teaching all these high energy classes. And I actually went to the doctors and found out that my vitamin D was literally on the floor. Easy fix easy fix to take vitamin D supplementation or just get out. Really, I should have gone on holiday. So a lack of vitamin D is going to cause inflammation from the fructose in your blood cells. OK, now um, let's look at fat. Now, this is, you know, I obviously encourage a high fat diet in the beginning to basically reprogram the body to burn fat as a fuel and to remember that, oh, yes, I've been storing some of that for the last <laughs> 10 years. So use that up. So there is a reason. However, again, not all fats are created equal. So saturated fat coming from uh, animal sources, uh, uh, obviously going to be solid at room temperature. Um, Oils that are obviously liquid at uh, room temperature, polyunsaturated oils, vegetable oils, are the biggest problem. The only difference is the amount of hydrogen in there. So when you get margarine, all they've done is bought a polyunsaturated oil into the lab and added hydrogen to it, right? <laughs> it's going to stay in your body twice as long. <laughs> it's not natural. Um, we want to avoid polyunsaturated fats okay now um with regards to uh the other fats i mean there, there's nothing wrong with you know we were told wrong butter is absolutely fine 
Um, you can get uh, fat from other sources, you know, different cheeses, um, cream. Uh, I don't recommend milk. Um, avocados. Uh, the thing is, uh, oil, oily fish. Now, this, this, this is the thing. This is the thing. Omega-6 to 3 ratios is something that is not really spoken about too much. And I have to admit, um, because I'm not a lover of oily fish, I have to say, that I remember even doing my uh, nutrition and sports nutrition course, you know, back in 95. And the advice was to, you know, to, to advise people to eat oily fish twice a week for the omega threes in those. But it was never really, it was just sort of, you know, it's something I just happened to say through habit. I didn't really understand the whys behind it. And this is, is really key for our overall health and re reducing inflammation. Now, the reason I know this now is more recently, I have added it to my uh, VIP membership because I work with a company that tests. We do a home blood test, dry blood test that gets sent to a lab in Norway to test the omega-6 to 3 ratios. Now, I have to admit mine was terrible. And I, I knew it was going to be bad because I knew I wasn't eating oily fish. You know, I, d I just don't like the taste of it. And I and I wasn't supplementing at the time. But even what tends to happen is even most people who feel that they are having a balanced diet and maybe could be supplementing with a, an omega-3 oil or fish oil or krill oil, again, their ratios were out of whack. The goal is a three to one ratio, which is where I'm at now. Now, what is the issue now that the, the, the is well the proofs in the pudding there omega-6 are found in manufactured processed all, all, all the bad foods as you can imagine okay so your omega-3s are going to be found in things like yeah oily fish um olives olive oil and the ratio ideally is three to one so what happens well when you get the test results, it will actually give you a breakdown of how much inflammation are in your cells. It's absolutely incredible. Too much omega-6 is a cause of inflammation on a cellular level. Now, another thing uh, to note is that also it will affect the cell, how do we call it, the cell fluidity. So in other words, you know, too many, like I said, polyunsaturated oils, which we were advised to consume more of. So people were only doing what they were advised to do. Uh, but too many of these omega-6s, and they are really in everything, um, will also the cell, the, the cell wall, the cell membrane it, is filled with fat. So if it's omega-3, it's going to be fine. Omega-6s, it, it thickens. So what what, what's happening there is then whatever you eat, uh, the, nu the nutrients from your food cannot pass through the cell wall because the cell wall is too thick. So it doesn't matter what kind of diet you're eating. If you're, if you're not consuming the nutrients from that diet, you're not getting the benefit. So you're not being able to utilize all those nutrients. Um, so, it is so important to balance out that omega six to three ratio. It also affects uh, the mitochondria wall. So, you know, linked with your, the muscles, you know, and how, um, again, nutrients are gonna be transported to and from. So, the, you know, this is why, yeah, you wanna be having a high, high fat and low carbohydrate diet because the sugars, the carbohydrates, the fructose is causing inflammation, but also the bad fats are causing inflammation. On top of that stress, everybody is under so much stress these days. Um, so again, it all points to, it's this, this, this cocktail at the end of the day that it, it's gonna end in 
dis-ease, a body that's not at ease. Because there's, ne there's never going to be just one culprit. I mean, I know we're all looking for, for one thing, one fix. It's, 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 you know, when we get a symptom of an illness, we, we are so conditioned to give our power away and we, we, we want to go to a doctor and get a miracle pill to solve that symptom. But it's not as simple as this. And, and in a way, this is why I've started these, uh, this radio show and podcast is, is to offer up alternative solutions and know that, you know, there's a holistic way of looking at things and restorative health is absolutely possible because we are doing this to ourselves and we are in the habit of doing these things to ourselves because we've got into some very poor eating habits, you know, myself included. And, and I definitely backtracked um, throughout lockdown. I think last May I just hit that self-sabotage button. And even though I knew these foods were unhealthy for me, it's not going to help um, my overall health. I just hit that button. I didn't care. So we, we are actually slowly killing ourselves through our lifestyle choices. But a lot of it has stemmed from what we've been advised to do. You know, we were told to switch from butter to margarine. We were told to cut the fat off meat and have lean meat. Um, and the problem is nowadays, maybe I wouldn't eat so much the fat off certain meat cuts because, you know, a lot of it these days, if it's not organic and grass fed, you know, you don't know what's been pumped in. And of course, toxins collect in the fat cells. So even when suggesting to go for a low carb, high fat diet, I still would be a little bit wary of the fatty cuts of meat unless they are organic and grass fed. So there are other ways of increasing uh, your fat intake and to balance out the omega six to three ratio is very, very simple. I use uh, what is called a balanced oil. So it's a very, um, it's an incredible scientific blend of your um, fish oils and your polyphenols from the, uh, a lot of it comes from the olives. Okay. So that will balance out through testing. So we offer a blood test at the beginning and then you can have another blood test four months down the road. And, you know, the results are there. You'll, you'll be pretty much on a back to a three to one. And it will show you how much inflammation is, is there in your body on a cellular level. See, we don't want this. We don't want the response. So it's like we don't want inflammation there too long. Um, you know, this is why even things like, I don't know, hay fever, for instance, it's a uh, it's triggering a response, right? It's uh, so you take an antihistamine to try and reduce everything. It's all linked. It's all everything seems to be linked. And uh, the stress hormone cortisol is, is is another huge thing. So it isn't just your diet. You've got to look at stress. You've got to look at what chemicals. You know, are you even down to you know some of these plug-in. Uh, air fresheners and the, what co what toxins are being released? Maybe look at alternatives and go for an, an aromatherapy um, blend rather than a you know a, a, a chemical based. What chemicals are you using to clean the house with? For some people, inside the house can be more toxic than even outside. I mean, outside we we don't tend to have any control of, right? Maybe depending on where we live. Um, but, you know, I'm in London. That's uh, the air quality isn't necessarily the greatest as maybe it would have been better staying in the Algarve, getting the sea air, literally being able to walk to the beach and and uh, getting the sea air, which is funnily the salt. Uh, salt is a, oh, it's a natural antihistamine. So even that is helping 
against inflammation. Uh, and again, we were told that salt was bad because there was so, so much salt added to processed foods. But now, uh, primarily, uh, I eat a whole food diet. I need, to, I need those electrolytes. I need the sodium, bicarbonate even, bicarbonate soda, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Magnesium is, is an electrolyte that's going to help. Even going back to inflammation when you get, if you've had an injury, a sports injury or, you know, you've overworked the muscle, repetitive strain injuries, all these kinds of things, then, you know, so really looking at are you getting the electrolytes? These are the spark of life and these are going to give you, these are going to give you energy. So I know there's a lot to take in there, but let, let's go through the solutions, really. The solutions are eating is, is going to be going back to eating real food, whole foods where possible, because the inflammation is being caused by the stuff that's in these manufactured processed foods and too many carbs, too much fructose. So, so that, that's one thing, because then you're in control of what you're eating. Let's go back to how we used to eat before. Now, I could tell in, in, in my own body that inflammation, this, I didn't have so much swelling. I was holding on to water. Um, so that's, that's one part of inflammation, right? By switching to a low-carb, high-fat lifestyle that helped not just with uh, the weight loss but also reduced the swelling um low carb high fat obviously going to be reducing the fructose which is a uh, uh, causing the inflammation it's also going to reduce uh, the the glucose you know at the end of the day low carb high fat doesn't mean you're not eating any carbs um there's enough carb because you need glycogen for certain um, things that are going on in the body. But even if you had a very, very low carb intake, you know, you'd still, protein will still actually switch to enough uh, glycogen to, to, to be used for certain, for certain things so that you're not going to be in any danger, okay? Because that would be uh, the, you know, when people are against a low-carb high fat, they say, oh, you know, you need glucose for certain things. Yeah, no, don't worry. Your body will create enough. Your body will create enough. The problem is, is that we are addicted to it. We have become addicted to sugar, glucose, fructose, whatever, that energy source. And as I said, that energy source is very limited in the body, which is why when we use it up or if we exercise, Obviously, we're really hungry again because the body wants that quick fix. You know, it takes it takes a little longer to start using the fat stores. And the way I describe this to clients is, you know, your carbohydrate. When when you when you if you're choosing food to eat, it's like you've got the choice of either having a little mini fridge by the side of you that has limited storage space, but you know, with a phone call, it gets filled up right so that's real easy option whereas the other option if you're going to use fat as a fuel source well the fat may be stored in a chest freezer outside down the road in a garage you know under lock and key and you've got to find the lock and then of course it's frozen so it's not ready to be used yet you can't turn it into energy yet you can't turn it into ketone so you haven't got a microwave, so, you know, it's going to take hours to defrost. So it all takes time. It's all a bit of a too much faff, and you've got to bring it back in. Um, so which option would you go for? You would go for the easy access food energy that's in the small fridge. And that's what we've become addicted to. That's the difference. Whereas... The fuel that's stored in that chest freezer down the road is a much cleaner fuel source. Now, it's funny, even the way we look at things, um, you know, I used to look at the fact that a gram of protein or a gram of carbohydrates equals four calories and a gram of fat is equals nine. And I was thinking, oh, you know, that's terrible. But I was looking at it wrong. 
that's good. That means one gram of fat is actually more efficient. It's got more energy. And what happens with that, if you eat a few grams of fat as opposed to a few grams of protein or carbs, you're going to be fuller quicker. And it's actually giving your body what it actually wanted. I mean, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. They do not exist. You find me one. There isn't one. There is, however, essential amino acids and essential fatty acids. So amino acids is coming from your protein, from your meat and fish. Essential fatty acids, well, I'll give you three guesses where they came from, okay? We want more, we want not more omega-3s, but we want the omega-6 to 3 ratio to be about 3 to 1. So this is so, so important, right? We do not want to be eating the easy access, even though our body wants to save energy. So we, it will go to that easy access. Yeah, it will go, you know, if it's used up, what's in the fridge is going to be shouting out, feed me, feed me. And this is why we're hungry. This is why most people, when they try to go uh, on a, what they consider, what they've been told is a healthy eating plan, they tend to struggle because they're battling their hunger pangs. Now, there is another element to that, actually, as well, which is can be actually another cause of inflammation um, is, is uh, organisms in the gut. Right. We have good bacteria and bad bacteria. Right. So uh, and gut health is, again, is something that we don't talk about enough. And candida, which is a fungus, it's the yeast. Guess what it loves? It loves sugar. It loves sugar. Now, we also now know that the, we believe now there's actually a, a brain in the gut. So the gut, and, and they talk, you know, the gut brain talks to, to, the, to the brain. So we're not necessarily just fighting our own hunger and craving, whether it's sugary foods or whether it's bread or even crisps, it all breaks down to sugar. So if, can, if there's a lot of candida present, it's also telling the brain, feed me, give me sugar. So this is another cause. It's, it's, it's all, all linked, all, all linked. So by re reducing the supply to candida, you, I mean, you, there are some, some sort of negative side effects to candida die off. You know, you, you, you do... You have got to go through the he, what we call the healing crisis. There are things that can help. Um, but this essentially, it's, it, it, it's just to show that there is just, it's not one size fits all and that the majority of people, it will be the combination of things that are causing inflammation on the inside. Inflammation that we can't, we can't see. We can't see what's going on on the inside of our body. But if you feel that you are, you know, there could, you know, stress is one thing, chemicals, yeah, candida, um, lack of sleep, lack of vitamin D, too much artificial light. But rest assured, there is a huge possibility that you've got a lot of inflammation on a cellular level. But it can be reversed. And really, quite simply, and in not too long at all. Um, you know, like I said, with even with the blood test, four months, your, your inflammation will, will be dropped, and uh, the omega six to three ratio will be back to a healthy three to one. But also, yes, low carb, high fat diet, exercise, but not the exercise that I would necessarily have pushed years ago either. Not the high intensity stuff. Just the low intensity, light aerobic work, because you're doing it, you'll be doing it for one reason, um, and that is to reduce inflammation and also 
uh, with regards to triggering or manipulating the body to, to remember that, that they've got plenty of food energy stored on the body already. Um, you actually to, to use up the energy that's stored in the in the muscle fibers um, if you have carbs is going to be done through exercise and much better to do it through just light aerobic rather than sort of the real high intensity work which could cause inflammation because again too much exercise can actually be a cause of inflammation as we know as we know when we get injured right so it's having that balance. It is very easy to reverse it. The final thing um, which I, uh, I went on to study because, again, purely personal, from a personal point of view, um, when I did lose the weight so rapidly, in the beginning I had sort of loose skin and I wasn't happy about that at all. And then I, I looked at intermittent fasting. And so I introduced that into my program and the loose skin went. So again, my brain, I needed to understand why, because it, we've been taught that to even go without breakfast is terrible for you. So I actually studied um, Dr. Ashumi, who is a cell biologist from Japan. He won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for his research on fasting in phys physiology, okay? So what he found was that something quite miraculous happens when you go without food for about 19 hours, okay? This gets triggered and it, that what gets triggered is what we call autophagy. Now, this is all going to be linked to inflammation too, because it's going to help reduce inflammation. Now, autophagy, when that's triggered, it is the body's process of, uh, it's like it's the body's recycling system. Uh, and again, the, the easiest way to describe it to my clients is that if you remember the computer game Pac-Man, and imagine these little cells, you know, gobbling up things as it goes. So any damaged proteins, um, it will just eat up and it will create new cells out of stem cells. So, you know, that's great for anti-aging. Don't need all these expensive products, do you, right? So what else does it do? Because, uh, because you know, the, the way you've got to see it is we never used to consistently eat. We eat all the time because we're hungry, because we're addicted to the sugar. So years ago, we would feast and then there would be periods of famine feast and famine, feast and famine. And that was perfectly natural. And that is how our bodies are designed. And, you know, the way we're taught now is, you know, if you go without food and you're going to damage your metabolism, absolute rubbish. In fact, the opposite is true. And now, if you think about it, again, we if that were true, humans wouldn't have survived this long. Because if, if they were hunter-gatherers, if they had to go on a hunt and they weren't successful, so they didn't have a feast, what actually happens after a certain amount of time is mental clarity is improved. So brain fog is gone. Um, the human growth hormone is released. So they actually become stronger, fitter, faster. And I suppose in a way it's, it's a survival mechanism because then, you know, they need to be successful on the next hunt. So actually all these things it's like the body's recycling it needs to repair because it's had a rest from focusing on digestion all the cells are like you know hanging around bored thinking well maybe we should actually go and do the housework then you know it's like it's like going back to what i said about the stress hormone you know when when, when cortisol was there it's like focus on that and everything else, you know, it gets left. The housework gets left, you know, fighting viruses or bacteria gets left because it's focusing on that one thing. Well, it's the same thing with eating. If you're constantly asking your body to focus on digestion, all the other things, you know, some of, you know, obviously essential functions keep going, but other things get left. And then the body gets a bit sluggish, you know, uh, and over time, we become very unhealthy. 
So it's actually good for us to go periods, you know, specific control periods of not eating anything, just having water with electrolytes because you still need that spark of life. Um, you can have black coffee, black tea, but nothing else. Now, it takes a while. Again, this is all linked to being addicted to sugar. So with my program, I teach people to do this very gradually. You know, it takes four to six weeks to, to basically fully remind your body that fat actually is the best fuel source as opposed to glucose or fructose. So it takes about four to six weeks to remind it. So that takes a while. Now, once you're there, when you become fully fat adapted is what I call it, is something amazing happens when you do go without food. Now, once you're fat adapted and you do have periods of fasting, you do, you're do you not hungry. And there is a specific reason for that. That's because your liver can create up to about 700 calories worth of energy, even without food, without eating, without anything passing through the mouth. It can create up to 700 calories a day from your fat stores. So when you so so there's a obviously this is perfect you know if you, if you if you're somebody that wants to lose weight they want to obviously they don't want to lose muscle they want to just lose fat once you become fat adapted which which you do by eating a high fat diet and a low carb diet then when you introduce some extended fasting periods brilliant you, you're not going to be hungry because your body's uh, releasing uh, at least 700 calories. Obviously, you know, if you're you're used to eating 2,000, 700 calories is still very, very little. But it's still OK because autophagy is triggered and your body will go around your cells. Your little Pac-Man will go around and do the tidying up for you. Now, this helps with even things like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's can come from a buildup of damaged proteins in the brain. But guess what? When you've not eaten anything, well, the body's like looking for, well, what can we use as protein? Oh, there's some damaged protein up there in the brain that's been sat there for the last 20 years. It's start use, utilizing that. Or, oh, well, you know, she's lost a lot of weight, so there's a bit of loose skin here. Well, guess what? That's that's We can recycle that protein. So there's all sorts of huge health benefits that come from um, going through specific controlled periods of fasting. However, for somebody that's addicted to sugar, going fasting, they're going to be very sick, right? They're probably not going to be able to do it anyway because they're going to be starving hungry, they might feel very lethargic. They might be getting headaches. It's not advisable. You know, this is the reason I do things for a specific reason. So my clients follow a low-carb, high-fat, ketogenic, which is a healing diet. It's going to help reduce inflammation for one reason, to get fat adapted. Once they're fat adapted, they don't need to consume as much fat from their diet anyway. Because really, you want to start using up the fat that's stored in the body. And then by introducing very slowly, so we do this very slowly, people start with um, an intermittent fasting protocol of eating in everything, all their food in an eight-hour window, and then fasting for 16 hours. That will be step one. Even that might be a little bit of a struggle in the beginning. And then slowly reducing those eating hours to a six-hour window, a four-hour window. And maybe adding on a, a longer fast once a week, maybe a 30 hour and then, then eventually a 36 hour, eventually a 72. The amazing thing that happens between 36 and 72 hours of fasting, the huge health benefits. But it's not something you're going to do straight off the bat when you're addicted to sugar because it wouldn't be healthy. That's not healthy. But once you're fat adapted, of course, it's, it's incredibly healthy. And it's obviously reducing inflammation on a huge level.
And, and the best part of it, it's completely free because <laughs> you're consuming nothing. Literally water. Water, I always add electrolytes to the water. If I don't have, I do have a, a special sort of keto drink that has um, electrolytes. Whereas before, when I first started with this, I would add bicarbonate of soda, uh, soda? bicarbonate of soda, um, pink Himalayan sea salt and potassium in, uh, um, mixed together in uh, specific quantities. Um, and a little bit added to water. And the reason is for that is that potassium and, and sodium in, in particular are the two electrolytes that are in charge of pushing the water into the cells to hydrate the cells. Because even though we've been told to drink a lot of water, if we just drink plain water and a lot of it, we can actually do more damage. We can actually flush more minerals, essential minerals out of the body. It's like, you know, pulling the chain on a on the toilet, you're just flushing straight through. Whereas the whole point of being hydrated is that you don't want water just sitting in your belly and then passing out. You want it actually going into the individual cells. And that's why it's essential to have the electrolytes. So then obviously calcium is in, in charge of other things um, uh, for muscle function as well and nerve function. And then obviously magnesium, but magnesium is the one electrolyte I probably don't consume as a supplement orally, I choose to put it in the bath. I, I like to have bath. I'm not, not everybody has baths. They're shower people. So, you know, there are other ways of, of absorbing magnesium. You can get a, uh, an oil, a transdermal oil to put on the skin. Um, I just personally didn't get on with that because I just felt like I've got something sticky on my skin. Whereas you can, I, I do like a bath. So I put either Epsom salt, sometimes I have a tub of Epsom salts to go in the bath. That, that is a form of magnesium or actually you can get magnesium flakes. It's just different types of magnesium. But um, again, they have essential roles on, on, on certain uh, bodily functions, as it were. So I would always recommend anybody who's fasting once they are fat adapted so that they're still getting energy and they're not going to, you know, they're going to have mental clarity. Um, they're going to reduce inflammation. All sorts of things are going on on the inside to improve overall health. So obviously this helps against any viruses because guess what? When autophagy is triggered... The moment a bacteria or a virus invades the body, it's on it. Those Pac-Man are e eating it out, right? So this is for overall health. So I do feel, although, um, you know, on the face of it, people would maybe think that uh, I am helping just people to lose weight. It's very superficial. I was always taught to sell people what they want and give them what they need. Now, in the beginning... My own personal journey was very superficial. I didn't care really about how, I just wanted to lose weight. So it was very superficial. It was only when I went and studied under Professor Tim Noakes um, and understood it from the point of reversing type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome, the huge benefit it has with Alzheimer's and uh, ADHD and all sorts of things. And obviously athletes, especially endurance-based athletes, rather than hitting that wall and over-prolonged uh, carb loading, get developed type 2 diabetes, um, this has a huge effect. So I know that what I'm advising is not just about weight loss. It's about reducing inflammation on a cellular level so that people live a much healthier life. So it might not be the thing that I, I speak about, first of all, because a, a lot of people come to me just because they want to lose weight. But I'm very happy in the knowledge that what I'm actually giving them is long-term health. So awesome. Thank you uh, for listening. I'll be back on Monday with a Coffee with Karen. Welcome to the Coffee with Karen podcast, 
a weekly chat show discussing everything from holistic health to current affairs, from a mental, physical and spiritual perspective. Get your weekly cup of positivity with a sprinkling of woo-woo.